On the CBS News Weekend Roundup, I'm Stephen Portnoy at the White House. John Spicer, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for coming by. I want to ask you about some day of air news. Sure. Uh, the FBI director went to Capitol Hill this week uh, to talk to a select group of congressional leaders. Multiple outlets, including CBS News, are reporting that he intended to tell the leaders that the FBI did not wiretap Trump Tower. Shouldn't that be the final word on this? Well, I think that's up to Congress. that have suggested activity during the 2016 election. Um, so it shouldn't just be one interview. I think there's a lot that they need to look at, and then, uh, then they do need to issue a report to us. Director Comey has been invited by the House Intelligence Committee to testify publicly a week from Monday. If he winds up at the witness table and says publicly what he intended to tell the leaders in private in the gang... Well, let's be, I, let's be clear, obviously. One of the things that's interesting is uh, we continue to hear... Uh, you know, anonymous sources saying that this is what someone said. We actually never actually hear the individual talk themselves or direct quotes. It's, it's always sources close to somebody or people that we believe, and I think it's time that in some cases we do hear directly from the sources. If Director Comey does say it publicly a week from Monday, is that not risking an embarrassment for the president? Well, I think, that, that I think there's a lot that needs to get discussed about the 2016 election. We've also had Director Comey brief several people who have unequivocally said, Senator Rubio, uh, Chairman Devin Nunez of the House Intelligence Committee, who said that there was no activity, uh, there was no coordination or no activity, I forgot how it was phrased, uh, to, or evident to support this, these stories that have been kind of going um, in several outlets about activity with the Russians in the campaign. And yet, where is the credibility there? And it's interesting, people who were briefed over and over again by Director Comey came out and said that to, they saw nothing to lead them to believe. And so the media kept writing that story for months on end despite that, and yet in this case, it's let's rush to judgment. So to me, it's interesting to me how there's such a double standard in the media when it comes to on one story, when people be briefed by Director Comey come out and say that there's no evidence there, and the immediate rush to judgment is, well, we're still gonna write the same story with some unnamed sources perpetuating the same false narrative. On the other story, it's shouldn't we take Director Comey's word that he still has yet to directly address for, you know, uh, as the final as the final word, I, I, it is interesting to me how the, the double standard the media employs in these two very uh, different stories. I want to ask you about Obamacare. Sure. Uh, a number of conservatives are publicly opposed to the House GOP proposal. I, 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 the phrase they're using on talk radio that I heard this week is "rhino care." Um, they're most upset about the tax credit provision in the bill. They see it as a new entitlement, and there's a new call to ramp up the winding down of Medicaid and Medicaid right. expansion to 2018. Um, the president is signaling his willingness to negotiate, and yet Paul Ryan suggested yesterday that this is the, this is the only package that can pass the House. So how's this gonna work out? How's this gonna wind up on yeah. the president? So, so let's, let's kind of break that down in a few things. Number one, we have to understand that this is a three-pronged approach. Uh, there's stuff that's done through an arcane process called reconciliation. It's how Obamacare was passed in the first place. It's a mechanism by which the Senate only needs 50 votes to pass something because of the impact it has on, on the budget, uh, on revenue and, and uh, spending. Uh, and so we have to unwind it in the same way that they created it. Uh, there are certain things that you can do through reconciliation, which is what we're proposing now through this bill. There are certain things that are done administratively in the same way that they, because they rushed it through so quick when they passed Obamacare, they gave the then Secretary of Health and Human Services, they gave her a tremendous amount of authority to implement various aspects of Obamacare. We now have to use that same authority that they gave Kathleen Sebelius to give Dr. Tom Price to unwind it. And then the third is the legislative piece that allow people to have um, high-risk pools among small business, uh, small businesses buy across state lines, allow the expansion of health savings accounts. All of those kind of things happen in three different ways, in much the same way that they passed theirs. Now we've got to kind of do it in a similar pattern. That being said, let's look at one provision, the tax credits. Right now, if you, most Americans get their health care through their employer. They are not taxed, their employer is not taxed, which is in contrast to small business owners and entrepreneurs who are taxed on that. They have to use post-tax dollar to pay for it. There is a unlevel playing field right now, and I think if you're a conservative, if you're an American, if you're an entrepreneur, that you should recognize that there is a very unfair playing field on which uh, small businesses, people who file as sole proprietors, 
uh, faced with getting their health care and what they have to pay for. So ironically, it is a very unfair field as it exists. Obamacare is failing on its own weight. Premiums are going skyrocketing, and, and we have more and more people getting less and less coverage, either the plan that they want or the doctor that's part of that plan. And so I would ask any conservative, or frankly any lawmaker, this is the only alternative to repeal and replace health care with a patient-centered so are tax credits and Medicaid expansion, are those things the president is willing to negotiate on? Or well, on the tax credits, no. I mean, that, that's essential to this, right? If you don't start giving some equity to people who, uh, who are small business owners, ranchers, farmers, um, who have to buy their insurance on the open market, um, you know, young people uh, who may not have a job right now or off their parents' insurance after 26, there's a lot of people who, you know, millions of people that have to go into the, the, the single market. Um, and we want to make sure that they have the same advantages that every other American has uh, who gets their benefits through either employer-based or through Medicare, or Medicaid, or TRICARE. The president's hitting the road next yes. week. Yep. Uh, you had some members here at the White House. We've had members here almost every day. Uh, and I think, you know, bipartisan, bicameral, um, trying to make sure that we talk to them about concerns they have. There'll be a group uh, uh, that'll be here today, uh, Friday, to promote, uh, the, the help the chairman. And they're, they're here for three things. One is to thank them for the work that they did. Two is to recognize the unanimous nature by which this got through. For all the talk about how controversial this is, uh, the, the bill went through two different committees. Over 50 members of Republican, uh, and none of them, all of them voted for it. And then third is I think we have to plan that third prong. Is what are the other legislative pieces that need to get passed? Let me ask you a question about that third phase. It's going to take, you would admit, 60 votes for the third phase. That's it has to, right. right. And that's why it's important for listeners to understand the difference between what that, this reconciliation phase that takes 50 votes in the Senate, but you're only allowed to do certain things in that vehicle. So is, is the sense here then that it's going to take until 2019, the intervening mid, the midterm election, to get a No, no, no. Senate? I think um, you, you're going to have enough votes to get that legislation. Because remember, we're talking about individual bills that help fulfill the ultimate uh, comprehensive package. We're talking buying insurance across state lines, allowing small businesses to pull the expansion of health savings accounts, all things that are hugely popular. Got it. Um, job numbers. Yeah. 235,000 jobs created. Great drop to 4.7. Right. Uh, is the best yet to come? Is this just a, a I hope so. Look, I, I, don't want, I don't think you ever want to own one particular month, um, but it's definitely a promising sign. Um, we were expecting to get 200,000 jobs. 235,000. Um, this is a promising sign unequivocally because we have seen small and large businesses from across the country uh, talk about their desire to buy into President Trump's agenda, to talk about hiring more Americans, uh, to talk about creating more manufacturing, more expanding here in the U.S. They understand that the tax and regulatory climate that they face right now is not favorable. And that's why we've seen so many jobs go overseas or so many businesses shut in their doors or, or fail to expand. I think they understand when you look at the confidence levels um, in so many of these indexes that get put out, uh, business owners are, are at an all-time high because they believe that the agenda that they're seeing and the vision that they're seeing is one that they can, um, they can, they want to participate in. Two last questions. One is, uh, I want to ask you about something that former Defense Secretary Liam Panetta said on the CBS Evening News this week. He essentially said that the President has to be careful road trust in the presidency, the things he does, the things he says, the things he tweets, that that could weaken his effectiveness abroad and here at home in the challenge of getting things done. Uh, is there anyone here in this building who has a kind of relationship with the president where they can walk into the Oval Office and say, sir, I'm sorry, that one went a bit too far? Absolutely. Uh, not just that, the president takes a ton of advice from uh, his senior team, but from a various number of advisors and his cabinet members. He looks to everyone from his national security advisor, General McMaster, to the chief of staff, Ron Freeman, to Stephen Bannon, to the Treasury Secretary, Stephen Mnuchin, so many others on the financial and national security front, as well as every other. And whether it's, it's you know, Dr. Ben Carson at HUD, uh, Linda McMahon at the Small Business Association, that Rex Tillerson at State, these are the people that he chose to come in and give him counsel on a variety of subjects. Um, ultimately, he's going to be the decider, though. That's why he got elected president. So he takes a lot of advice, a lot of opinions, um, a lot of ideas into his decision-making process, but ultimately it's he who makes that decision and what he believes will be move the country forward. 
This is day 50, as we sit here in your office. Um, it's been a very interesting almost seven weeks. I've, I've sat in this office and, and you know, we've had a back and forth in the briefing room and I've, I've watched you sometimes get a little hot about what you see on TV. And I'd say passion. Passion. <laughs> uh, but even, even with, with some of the, the graphics that are used on public. Right. Um, what is your take on the state of things? And, and I want to ask you, how are you, how are you dealing with the grind of this job? Uh, well, uh, I enjoy it. I thrive off of it. It's a phenomenal opportunity to represent the change that uh, the American people asked for in the election, and, uh, and it's really neat to be part of having this kind of seat in history and to watch this stuff happen. To know that you're moving the country forward and lifting up every American's life in one way or another, making the country more safe. Uh, the president has an agenda, and he's here to, to see it fulfilled. And I think one of the things that you see in poll after poll is whether or not the American people have voted for him or not, or agree with him on every issue or ideologically. They give him high marks for the promises that he's kept. I think that's really important, especially in a town that suffers from a lack of trust. But the grind. These days are long. The days are long. You got to. I mean, you you work for uh, President Trump. You're here early and you stay late. Um, he understands that the presidency is is a fixed amount of time. You get so long to fulfill the promises that he wants to use every minute of every hour of every day to do what he said that he was going to get done. And Someday he wears you out almost every day, um, but he understands that this is his opportunity uh, to do what he said and to make the country better and make it great again. Sean Spicer, thanks a lot. Thank you.